I have a principle never to give the same lecture twice. So this is an updated version of the Swedish Royal Academy of Sciences lecture, but things go so fast. So there's actually things to update, even though just a few weeks have passed. The framing for this, um, you know, journey in the scientific update of humanity's challenges on planet Earth must start, of course, with what I would argue being the most uh, fundamental um, scientific insight to humanity over the last 10 years, namely the conclusion that we've entered a whole new geological epoch, that we now are us humans, anthros in Greek, the dominating force of change on planet Earth. We have entered our own geological epoch. We surpass the natural variability that is, of course, there and will continue to be there from solar radiation variabilities in terms of forcing, but also extreme events like volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. We surpass this in scale, in speed and in the interconnectivity in the globalized world we live in. We see the impacts on climate change. We see it on the mass extinction of species and ecological functions, but we see it also in COVID-19. And I think this is one of the in my mind, most important insights of, of the pandemic, that this is a predicted, manifested part of something we could expect in the Anthropocene, and that we are in a situation where we are not facing one crisis, the health crisis, we have an intertwined climate crisis and an ecosystem crisis. And this will come across as no kind of, it's a kind of an obvious fact for, for this community, but it's not well understood out there in the world, but just the fundamentals that uh, something like 60% of the new infectious diseases over the last 20 years are zoonotic viral spillovers from wildlife, often via domestic animals to humans, and that they are a result of risks increasing due to unsustainable and high risk exploitation of natural habitats, basically wildlife trade, expansion of agriculture, combined with very dense domestic wildlife markets and trading such as the wet market in Wuhan. And my conclusion of this is uh, hopefully something that can help us navigate our future in the Anthropocene because what happened in a wet market in Wuhan and propelled itself like a bushfire across the entire planet in a blink of time was a mismanagement of a commons. And it's exactly in the same way with climate impacts on the commons that regulates the state of the climate system. That what happens in one corner of the planet, like the Arctic or the uh, AMOC in North Atlantic or the Amazon rainforest, can abruptly and irreversibly shift state and send in voices back across the entire planet. So we are in this, this embedded, turbulent reality of interconnectedness with multiple crises. Now, yesterday, the Global Carbon Project released its prognosis on the global carbon budget for 2020. It confirms that 2020 is unique. We have uh, up to almost 7% reductions in CO2 emissions projected for this year. That's a very interesting and important number. We see today where it originates from in terms of regions. You see China, US with a very deep drop, but also the European Union and India. This is uh, important for two reasons. One, of course, and the most important is that this is roughly exactly the pace that we now need to follow for the next 30 years. That's the carbon law that according to IPCC, if we bend the curve in 2020, which we have you know, kind of involuntarily done due to COVID-19. But if we follow this pace for the next 30 years, we are actually cutting emissions by half every decade and can land softly at a carbon neutrality in 30 years time. So that's, that's kind of just to show the pace and it shows the drama because of course, this is the largest impact on the global economy since the 1930s. So it just shows what a, what a scale of change we're talking about if we are to every year reduce emissions by six, seven percent, which the carbon law requires. But the second insight is, of course, this is nothing to celebrate. That if we are to reduce emissions by killing jobs and the economy, 
then we are in the old environmental story, the, the story of the 1960s and 1970s, where we always portrayed as us having a total contradiction between environmental potential catastrophe and human prosperity, and that it was a choice between the two. And of course, what we're seeing in 2020 is an example of the kind of trade-off that we are absolutely under no circumstance going to promote. The challenge here is to do exactly what we see on this screen, but to show that it gives more prosperity, better equity, better health and better economy. And that is, of course, climate kicks heart in a way. We're not in a good situation. The emission gap report was also released after Anders, the, the Swedish World Academy of Sciences lecture, uh, confirming what we all know, unfortunately, that the global gap is just widening. We have today a 35 billion ton carbon dioxide gap over the next 10 years. When you just compare the best promises today in the orange line here with where we have to be for 1.8 degrees in the kind of violet line, but all the way down to 1.5 degrees being the carbon law, cutting emissions by half over the next decade. So my conclusion is that we have entered potentially the most decisive decade for humanity's future on Earth. Not that we fall over a cliff 2031, but that we have so much scientific evidence that it's in these 10 years that we determine with a high likelihood whether or not we keep the resilience in the Earth system intact, whether we can keep the carbon stocks and the carbon sinks and the albedo effects and the ocean heat uptake capacity intact, so that we can have a soft landing throughout the second half of this century. So that's kind of the core focus of this lecture. What, what does it take to be stewards of the planet? But just before that, briefly, just a reminder, we are at 1.2 degrees Celsius warming. We are bound to have 2020 as one of the top five warmest years on record. We have had a terrible 2020 due to the pandemic. But it's easy, therefore, to forget that it started in a very terrible way indeed with the devastating forest fires in Australia with its massive impacts on nature and humans and the economy, but also an enormous pulse of additional carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We have a second heat wave in Europe after the 2018 heat wave, but most worrisome is the amplification of up to five degrees Celsius warming increase in the Arctic with during the summer a 38 degrees Celsius record observation of temperatures in Siberia, which amongst others have led to the zombie fires, fires in peatlands that cannot be extinguished because it's simply carbon slowly but surely burning. And this is something expected, unexpected. It's happening faster than, than science had predicted. And on top of all that, we have the amplified extreme events such as the floods in Bangladesh uh, that, that are impacting at now such a large scale that we can, we can truly talk of 1.2 degrees Celsius warming being a point with very significant invoices being sent back across the world. So much, in fact, that we know that 100 countries and regions in the world have proclaimed a climate emergency, the European Union being one of those regions. We have, as you may know, in the scientific community, together with the Club of Rome, um, kicked off a heads of state dialogue to discuss the potential need to consider one step, uh, one, one additional step of aggravation that we have scientific evidence that is not only a climate emergency, then we in fact have to consider declaring a state of planetary emergency. Now, what does that mean? Well, to begin with, it has never been considered before. It should never have to be considered more than once in the existence of a species on planet Earth, because either it never happens, the need for an emergency point at the planetary scale. And of course, if it's declared, hopefully one resolves it and learns from that and never does it arise again. So it's not taken lightly, I can reassure you. Now, what, what's the scientific justification for an emergency? Well, an emergency is always defined by catastrophic risk, something that is unacceptable, like your house burning down or someone drowning, multiplied by running out of time, by the lack of time. 
So it's always urgency multiplied by risk. And in 30 years time, or even 40 years time, climate scientists and sustainability scientists have been warning about catastrophic risk. We have James Hansen giving his testimony in Congress in 1988, warning humanity for catastrophic risks of anthropogenic global warming. We have for so many decades known that we are entering the sixth mass extinction of species, undermining life support for food production and human well-being. This has been warned for decades, but still there's never been a suggestion from science to declare a state of emergency. The emergency point comes from the fact that now we have only 320 gigatons of carbon dioxide left in the global carbon budget to have a 66% chance of balancing global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. So a two, two out of three chance, so one out of three chances to fail with a budget that divided by 40, the 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide we emit per year, gives us only eight more years. So it's even within this decade, if we continue burning fossil fuels as today, we have only eight years left. For a well below two degrees Celsius budget of 700 gigatons, we have another 25 years. So it's within our lifetime that we determine the future for all future generations with the high likelihood. That's what makes it an emergency. And moreover, we have, as you know, the scientific evidence that we can today say unequivocally that the only way to succeed with Paris is to decarbonize the world's energy system, yes, phase out fossil fuels, and secure the carbon stocks and sinks in all the natural ecosystems, and solve in exactly the same pace as carbon dioxide, the short-lived climate forcers, and all the other greenhouse gases, such as methane and nitrous oxide. So we have a package of a global sustainability transformation that operates at the exact same time step, meaning this is the decade. It's the decade of having to halt nature loss, and it's a decade of having to bend the global curve and really rush towards a carbon neutral world economy in just 30 years time. That, dear friends, it was takes us to an emergency point. And this dialogue is now increasingly held, and, and our suggestion has been to bring this all the way to the Security Council of the United Nations. Why? Not to scare humanity, but to do, as, as uh, Sandrine dixon leclerc points out all the time, emergency for emergence. Basically, emergency, you always declare or recognize emergency as a way of rising to get, let's say, intelligence, innovation, and adrenaline into a process of resolving the challenge. So that's where we are. Just to give you one flavor of the drama here, I find this to be perhaps the most dramatic geopolitic science finding of the last few months. It's a paper that came out just a few months back called The Climate Niche, um, led amongst others by scientists closely associated to the Potsdam Institute like Tim Lenton at Exeter, but led by Xi Xu. What you see here is the base map in the back, which is the fragility of states in geopolitical terms, the base map of vulnerability of societies, the darker, the red, the more vulnerable are the countries. You recognize the developing countries in, in Africa and the equatorial belt. The darker the blue, the more stable the countries. The dark black spots here are the regions in the world that today have an average annual temperature exceeding 29 degrees Celsius. That's a health point. It's a threshold determined by, by physiologists that beyond that point, we risk very severe impacts on human health, potentially also risks of mortality. These are the regions where you have a number of days of the year exceeding 50 degrees Celsius of heat that can be that can threaten threaten your your life um, if you are in those environments. Now what you see in the in the dashed lines here is if we continue burning fossil fuels and cutting down trees as we do today, we would in just 50 years time, 50 years time by 2070, end up having regions in the world exceeding 29 degrees Celsius warming, covering that whole uh, area you see in the, in the dashed lines. And these are not any regions in the world. I mean, it's enough just to see this map to see what, what, what enormous 
social, economic, and geopolitical drama this would entail. It's large parts of Latin America, the whole of West Africa, the Horn of Africa, the Middle East, India, Southeast Asia. We would go from 100 million people hosted in, in these unlivable areas to over 3.5 billion people in only 50 years time hosted in what essentially is unlivable conditions. You can just see, you can almost see in front of you the displacement pressures, the instabilities occurred just by heat. I mean, we're not even including disease patterns, water scarcity and other extreme events. So that is the reality of, of why it's such a decisive point where we are today. But what I will focus the, the, the this continued part of this lecture is actually not on these extreme impacts, not on on the emergency point. I want to tell the story of the planet, the story of what is it that is at stake here? What, what are we talking about in terms of the stability of the Earth system for humanity's future? And of course, this is the iconic Apollo 8 picture of Earthrise. It's the, it's the recognition that once you see the little blue planet in this way in reality, it reconfigures your brain and reconnects your whole soul to planet Earth. Today, not everyone can go out in space, but, but my conclusion is that we global sustainability scientists are essentially trying to help humanity to reconnect to the planet by understanding what is it that makes this little system tick in our favor. Now, ticking in our favor is something that we're starting to understand in quite, quite a high degree of detail. One tick is this phenomenal limit cycle of the Milankovic journey that the Earth system, the planet, has been through over the past 1.2 million years, what we call the entire Pleistocene period. Here we have on the x-axis from minus four degrees to the deepest blue to the left to plus four degrees warming to the furthest right. And you see the long cycles of ice age with the short cycles of interglacials. We've had six to eight such cycles over the past 1.2 million years. It's the only period during the entire 4.5 billion years of the Earth's existence that the planet has these cycles in and out of, of ice ages and, uh, and short intermittent interglacials. You see among the interglacials here how narrow these cycles are. They are between minus one and two degrees Celsius. If you go colder than that, the planet tips over into an ice age logic. Ice sheets expand so much, albedo takes us towards a self-cooling feedback and the system goes deeper and deeper into ice age. And when you're in the furthest left there, you have 70 meters lower sea level in, on, on Earth and vast expansion of ice. Even where I'm sitting now in Berlin, we have permanent ice. The temperature goes up with roughly one degree and feedback start changing direction. And we start seeing a self warming when the biosphere ice melts, the whole system starts feeding back greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the system warms, but it stays within these limit cycles. And if you look at the outer circle there, that's the Eemian. That's the warmest interglacial we know, which is 130,000 years ago. It's two degrees Celsius warmer than today. And that is the, the most recent interglacial. And at that point, believe it or not, but our estimates are quite unequivocally showing that sea levels at that point, at that outer two degrees Celsius interglacial was six meters higher than today. And look at the inner circle. That's the Holocene. That's the interglacial that we have been, been privileged to have as our planetary state since we left the last ice age. That's our Garden of Eden. That's the state that has enabled civilizations as we know it to develop because it isn't until we entered the Holocene, this little inner circle, that we domesticated animals and plants and went off into the civilizational journey that has taken us to the modern world that we know it today. Now we are pushing ourselves gradually out towards Eemian outer conditions. And the big question is, the grand scientific questions, which we don't have an answer to, is there a risk of pushing the planet out of this limit cycle that could take us towards a planetary threshold? That's the big question. And that is what I'm trying to focus on in this lecture. To give some kind of detailed understanding of this, I mean, one is, of course, what you have seen several times, the 
West Antar the, the Antarctic ice core data that can show this limit cycle back now 1 million year. This is the last 800,000 years with the last cycle of ice age and then bringing us into the Holocene to the furthest right. If we then zoom into this further, you have the last 20,000 years here, which is of course the most relevant for us, how we leave the last ice age, the minus four degrees Celsius point, and we enter this extraordinarily stable 10,000 year Holocene period. It's a plus minus one degree Celsius world. And then you have the spike when we start burning fossil fuels and enter the industrial era. The latest data here gives even more support for this extraordinary stability of the Holocene. Just look at this multiple set of data sources that again confirms that you know it's not even plus minus one it's rather one as a maximum uh, level and and minus 0 0.5 at its coldest point and now we are as you see to the furthest right there actually at the warmest point on earth since we left the last ice age at 1.2 degrees celsius we have already so say gone through the ceiling of the maximum temperature on Earth since the last ice age. This is significant also from the fact that we as Homo sapiens have only, as far as we know for certain, existed as modern humans for the last roughly 100,000 years. So this is the last 100,000 years, which is a very jumpy ride for, oops, sorry. It's a very uh, jumpy ride for, for the planet through the entire ice period here. We have temperatures actually varying with plus minus 10 degrees Celsius over just a decade until we leave the last ice age and enter what is in that little red circle there, the plus minus one degree Celsius Holocene interglacial stability. I find this to be so important to recognize that, you know, throughout this whole period, we've been fully modern humans. We've had the same physiological and an intellectual capacity to, to domesticate animals and plants and develop communities and civilizations as we know it. But we were just a few million people. We were hunters and gatherers. We had very likely a very rough time during this period. In fact, you may know that you see this dip here roughly at 75,000 years ago at the 75 point between the 60 and 80. The latest estimates indicate that we may have been down to less than 15,000, 15,000 fertile adults at that frozen point, that cold spot. And that is very likely when we were hiding in the Ethiopian highlands, one of the few spots where there was still some biomass and fresh water available. So that just shows how, how incredibly dependent we are on the Holocene. And if you zoom this out, it gives you a tremendous, like almost, almost humbling respect to the beauty of our planet in its current state. This is the last 60 million years and it's in a seminal paper by Burke et al. showing to the furthest right, you see the IPCC scenarios into the future. You have on the y-axis temperature, average temperature on Earth, the zero line. By the way, the zero line is always the pre-industrial global mean temperature. So it's the, it's the 14 degrees Celsius pre-industrial average temperature. So what you see here is to the if you if you would follow the, the the pink upper line here we're talking about the business as usual future that would take us as you see to roughly four degrees celsius warming by the end of this century the yellow line here is the garden of eden that that's the holocene 10,000 year period then you have a logarithmic scale here so you see the limit cycles the one million years in and out of ice ages and then we enter the deep geological era of the Pliocene, the Miocene, and how we enter the hothouse Earth some 50 million years ago called the Eocene. Now, if we would go all the way up to four degrees Celsius warming, as you see now from the black line, look at this. That would mean that we would, in a blink of time, wind back the climate clock like not 1 million years, not 3 million years, not 5 million years, but up to 10 million years. We would, you know, push ourselves back to the conditions on Earth as they were, according to our best understanding today, in the Pliocene, Miocene. We're actually outside of what I would call the, the, the planet as it's biophysically configured 
in the last three million years, meaning the only phase that has resembled our planet of today. That's the drama. That is what is at stake. And in comes the most recent analysis of this, which I find to be potentially the most important climate modeling result of this year. Uh, I have a little bit of a bias here, I must admit, because it's actually produced via the climber model here at the Potsdam Institute. It's the first time a physical climate model is able to reproduce the limit cycles between ice age and interglacial over the entire quaternary period. So the quaternary is the last three million years. It includes two epochs, the Pleistocene and the Holocene. Now, what you have on the y-axis is again, global mean temperature. The zero point is the pre-industrial level. And what you see here, I find to be like a piece of, of moral philosophy, essentially, because what this shows in green is that the planet has never, during the entire quaternary period, during the entire existence as the planet, as we know it, configured in a way that, that has any resemblance with the atmosphere and the biosphere and the cryosphere that we depend on. And during that entire period, the planet has never exceeded a global mean temperature of warming of two degrees. We've always stayed below two degrees Celsius. That's the green line you see here. The black lines are the validation points from ice core data. So as you see it, it's validated against observations. So the planet has stayed within an extremely narrow corridor. Minus four, you're in deep ice age. Plus two, you're in the warmest integration. And the planet has been oscillating up and down and up and down within this very narrow corridor, pushed there in and out due to natural variability, driven primarily by solar radiation, of course, but also shock waves of natural variabilities as volcanoes and earthquakes and other boosts of carbon dioxide, but always staying within this corridor. That in itself, you could almost ask yourself the question, do we really need more science to, to deliver on Paris than this graph? I mean, I mean, I'm putting it a bit simplistically. But the reason why I say this is also that we know we have a quite a good handle on why the planet has stayed within this very narrow corridor. And the reason number one is that the Earth system is so resilient. It has so many negative feedbacks, dampening biophysical capacities from permanent ice sheets in the Arctic and Antarctica that reflects back 90% of incoming heat back to space. These are air conditioning. These are cooling systems for the whole planet. The carbon sinks and stores in permafrost and soils, in forests, in peatland, the heat absorbed in the ocean, 90% of the heat caused just so far by fossil fuel burning is stored in the ocean. I mean, a massive risk for the future because the planet is like a thermostat that can release this, which it is doing by sipping out in terms of strengthening hurricanes and, and strengthening El Nino events. But it just shows this remarkable capacity to be our best friend. And that is, is in my mind, why we need a planetary stewardship uh, approach also to deal with the climate system. Why is this so important? Well, it is because we know that Earth resilience can be threatened by crossing tipping points and that these are real. We have so much knowledge today. This is the 2008 first attempt of identifying the systems, the biophysical systems, the so-called tipping elements that do regulate the state of the planet. This was the first attempt and um, it took us all the way to a basically a 10 year later update. This is the 2018 Earth Trajectories paper that uh, proposed for the first time the hothouse Earth hypothesis that if we burn fossil fuels, taking us to two degrees Celsius warming, is that a point at which we risk pushing the tipping elements here in yellow that have, as far as we know, a sensitivity to irreversibly start moving in a direction where they lose negative feedbacks to become self-amplifying uh, systems, which then could bump up the temperature not so much, perhaps only with 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees Celsius warming, but that that could be enough to start a cascade and push the systems that originally have a higher resilience, meaning that higher ability to withstand perhaps temperatures up to three degrees Celsius warming, but that we could come close to a point where that could lead to a domino effect and we could start seeing 
a journey where the planet would gradually drift away from a Holocene state in an irreversible journey. One year later, just before the COVID-19, actually, this was published just before COVID struck, we did the latest update on the science of these tipping elements, the 15 known tipping elements. And we published this and concluded that nine of the 15, and the nine are shown here, are what we just you know, simply called that they are on the move, meaning that they're showing signs of approaching tipping points. They are showing signs of slowing down, like the Atlantic circulation that is slowed down by 15% in the North Atlantic, the middle blob you see here, or the accelerated ice melt in the Arctic with a projection of losing Arctic summer ice potentially in the next 15 years, or the latest signs showing that we have crossed the tipping point in West Antarctica, irreversibly pushing ourselves to adding another one meter sea, uh, sea level rise over the next uh, centuries. So these are uh, systems that are starting to show worrying signs of being on the move. But not only that, the arrows here are, are based on deep, deep scientific progress. The, the, the evidence that these tipping elements are connected, that ground zero to a large extent of what happens on planet Earth is actually in the Arctic, that Greenland and the Arctic, when melting and the albedo effects on the jet stream and the fresh water into the North Atlantic, slowing down the AMOC, the Atlantic circulation, impacting on the South American monsoon, leading to dry out and forest fires in the Amazon rainforest, potentially pushing the whole massive carbon sink and the richest ecological habitat on Earth across a tipping point, which would lead it towards an irreversible savanna trajectory and how this is all connected even to the Southern Ocean because a slowdown of the whole overturning circulation leads to more warm surface water being stuck down in West Antarctica, melting faster or causing a, a, an accelerated melting of the glaciers on rock close to the water surface in, in, in West Antarctica. So this is the latest situation we're in. You've seen the science on parts of this. This is research that was published by colleagues of mine here at the Potsdam Institute on the slowdown of the of the AMOC. The latest research on crossing a tipping point in West Antarctica is incredibly dramatic because it shows that it's an hysteresis effect as well. You can easily push it too far, but you cannot go back. And moreover, it indicates that if we come to two degrees Celsius warming, every additional one degree of warming means another two meter sea level rise but between one and two degrees Celsius warming, every one degree means one meter sea level rise. I mean, that's already dramatic, but just the fact that it's, it's not linear, it's exponential, that if you continue warming the temperature, you get an accelerated level of committed sea level rise. And that is the latest status here. Just talking about how statuses advances in integrated science, here you have the situation like five, 10 years back on Amazon rainforest understanding. To the left, the assessment that, you know, if you deforest the Amazon down to 40%, lose 40% of, of tree cover, we are at risk of, of pushing the system across a tipping point. Or to the right, the latest, the assessments uh, just 10 years ago, that, that the system is probably able to cope with global mean temperatures up to four degrees Celsius warming before crossing a tipping point. Well, of course, when you integrate these sciences of ecology and climate, you end up with a completely different conclusion, as uh, Tom Lovejoy and Carlos Nobres did in a piece just two years ago, showing that we start seeing signs that the tipping point in the Amazon, because of global warming interacting with biodiversity loss, is probably a deforestation threshold of roughly only 20 to 25 percent before the system tips over. Now we are at 17% today, and the latest science by colleagues of mine, Ari Stahl and others here at the Potsdam Institute, shows that 40%, 40% of the Amazon rainforest is already today in, in a position at a bifurcation point where they could exist both as a rainforest and as a savanna state. So it's a rainfall has reduced so much that it's actually an, at a double point. Now, is this... Uh, where is the, the, the overall scientific understanding here? Well, I would say that it's not anymore only individual scientific groups 
coming up with these findings. It's also the broader scientific consensus is leading to the same conclusion and verifying this. This is the IPCC together with the World Meteorological Organization and the United in Science report one year back that summarized the latest 20 years of IPCC advancements. I mean, our, our most fundamental authoritative assessment of science and climate research. And this is the famous red embers diagrams. The darker the red, the higher is the conclusion of risk in science. And what you see here is again, global mean temperature warming from zero to six degrees global warming. And you see three clusters and to the furthest left is the impact on, on ecosystems. The middle is the impacts on extreme events and the furthest right is crossing tipping points. It is large scale discontinuities or thresholds. And each one of these columns here is one IPCC assessment. So it's like the knowledge base from 2001, the third assessment, all the way to the 1.5 report in 2018. And you can just look at the colors here to see, oh my God, what's happening with the more the science advances, the more we learn, the higher is the risk. The lower goes the temperature at which we risk triggering big ecosystem change, large scale weather events, and worst of all, crossing irreversible thresholds. And look at the temperatures here. 20 years back, the best assessment was that the risks were somewhere around 6 degrees Celsius warming. I mean, it means that the risk was considered to be basically zero because nobody was projecting a 6 degrees Celsius warming. In fact, we're not doing that even today. Today, because of our advancements in our understanding, we assess that the risks of crossing irreversible tipping points is down between two and two and a half degrees Celsius warming. So just to share with you that all the science I've been, I've been presenting here, even though it's in the frontier, is actually verified increasingly also by the IPCC. Now, so all this means in summary that we are at risk of, of drifting away from the only state we know for certain can support humanity, the Holocene state. We are already in the Anthropocene, but we are not yet in a, in a position where we can say that we have crossed a tipping point. The window is still open to try and navigate ourselves back to a stabilized Earth. So that's the moment. That's why it's an emergency point. That's why it's so decisive. That's why we need the planetary boundary framework or something similar to that, that integrates climate and biosphere and air pollutants and micro plastics together with the big functioning of the nitrogen, the phosphorus and the carbon cycle to have a whole earth system approach to global sustainability to give us the scientific targets that can provide a safe operating space in green for humanity. Science has been challenged by this and can today increasingly provide these science-based targets. And I want to kind of give a little bit of, of, um, of drama, but also hope in this assessment as a kind of closing part of this. It's a, a huge drama, therefore, I hope you agree with me on this uh, after this walkthrough, that the Anthropocene is, is a massive challenge and a huge risk for humanity. The hope we have is the following. The Holocene is a state. It's an equilibrium interglacial state of the planet. It's, it's, the, it's the planet sitting in a cup. But the Anthropocene is not yet an equilibrium state. We have not crossed a tipping point and the Anthropocene pushing us to, a, to an unstoppable hot state. No, the Anthropocene is so far a pressure, not a new state. When it comes to states, we know that the planet can, can only be in three main states. To the furthest left, a snowball, which we haven't been in for, if I recall right, at least 100 million years. This is when ice sheets expand so much that the whole planet becomes self-cooling. So it goes into a negative feedback dynamics towards a self-cooling down to essentially a snowball state. To the furthest right, you have the catastrophe future that the planet crosses a tipping point and self warms to a point of four, five, six degrees Celsius warming, the point of 50, 60 million years ago, the point when we had dinosaurs on Earth. And in the middle, we have this cycling, the dance between ice age and interglacial, and we are now in an interglacial. Now, the latest science shows that the door towards the next ice age may be closed, that we have probably caused so much climate forcing that we're unlikely to tip into a next ice age. So the big 
challenge for humanity is to avoid crossing tipping points that would take us irreversibly towards a hot house. And the good news is, at least in, in, in I think the mainstream assessment of science, is that we have not yet crossed that tipping point, but we are very close. So now we need to redefine sustainable development. It's, it's no longer about just reducing environmental impacts across the ecological, the economic and the social dimensions of sustainability. That's also important, but it's also about being stewards of the prosperity and equity within planetary boundaries or within a stable and resilient Earth system. We have to, you know, just like we've learned in COVID-19, take care of the whole planet. Now, are we doing that? Well, not so well. Uh, there's been the first attempt of applying the planetary boundary framework on all countries in the world by colleagues at Leeds University. And the conclusion is not surprisingly uh, quite daunting. On the x-axis, you have the number of planetary boundaries being transgressed. So the further you are to the right, the more you are in, in trouble. And on the y-axis, you have the number of social indicators that are achieved in terms of life expectancy and human development index and economic development. So the further up you are, the, the, the better is the social status and ability for human development. And not surprisingly, the rich countries in the world, the successful countries in the world, if, if one may say so, are in that upper right hand corner. You see Sweden and Germany and the European countries there. And the conclusion from this is that no country in the world is in the desired space. No country is scoring high on social indicators within the safe operating space of planetary boundaries. All countries are on the outside and particularly the rich countries in the world are still today delivering human well-being, delivering good modern lives at the expense of the planet. And this is, of course, what we need to break. And it's not so easy because economically there is even Nobel Prizes that go to a person like Bill Nordhaus claiming that going outside of a two degrees Celsius future would be even optimal for the world economy. The only reason he can say that is that it gives optimized conditions for certain parts in the northern hemisphere, according to his assessment, but very dramatic negative impacts on uh, developing countries. The latest assessment to the right here does actually prove him wrong that the GDP impacts even at 1.5 degrees Celsius, exceeding 1.5 degrees Celsius warming would be significant in terms of uh, two digit uh, level reductions in GDP. We also have the latest work by colleagues at the Mercator Center here in, in Germany that works very close with the Potsdam Institute showing that in the upper graph, the upper map here that you have regional gross product being threatened the up to 20, 30% reductions if we continue over the century with current production levels. And that this is because of a better incorporation of the damage functions related to extreme climate events. So as you see, if we, if we really put climate science into the economic models, there is absolutely no support that exceeding two degrees is, is possible for the world economy. Now, I just want to conclude and put this together in, in terms of the geopolitical risks here. Just put back the map of the heat for the future risk, the 3.5 billion that would be living in regions that are largely unlivable, and compare that with the impacts on the economies under that exact same future. And you can just see, not surprisingly, the quite very concerning overlap. And that migration risks are also being now assessed scientifically. And here you have the regions in dark red that are most likely to have climate migrants over the coming 50 years, which is coinciding exactly with this assessment of heat waves and impacts on the economy. So just a last kind of um, direction point of what all this means. It means following a carbon law. It means cutting emissions by half every decade, following this green line to stabilize the world economy at a carbon neutrality by mid-century. We know that we have to do the same for biodiversity. And as you may have seen quite recently, there was a study showing that that transformation is not only desirable for human well-being and economies, but also possible to do. So there's more and more evidence that both of these curve bending exercises of decarbonizing the world economy shown here in green and gray, but also keeping carbon sinks intact in nature in dark green and blue 
is not only necessary, but actually possible to do. What you see here, which is also picked directly from the IPC scenarios, is the food system transformation from the single largest emitter of greenhouse gases in dark brown that has to transform into becoming a very significant, not like the single largest carbon sink sector in orange in order to enable this transition. So we have an energy system that's be decarbonized, a food system that's a transition, and keeping the nature resilience intact. And the orange parts here is the big discussion on the need to scale negative emission technologies. So, you know, there's no doubt that we're talking about a global sustainability transition. And it doesn't start stop with the SDGs, of course, because that's only a milestone by in just 10 years time. We need to, you know, embark on this journey of the, this decade to cut emissions by half and halt loss of nature and then continue the journey so that we can you know reach this planetary bullseye in 2050 to have what we can you know start talking of prosperity and equity on a stable planet now is there any hope of us succeeding here to close well i think yes i think we're seeing more and more of a g3 emerging in the world uh, where the world's largest economies are aligning behind science-based targets of net zero in the next 30 years. We have today actually something quite exciting, announcing that the CEOs of all the truck manufacturers in Europe have gone together and aligned with science to stop selling combustion uh, engine trucks from 2040 in 20 years time. So of course there's momentum here and Climate Kick is right at the center of this. My plea is connect climate with this kind of integrated perspective of human prosperity and equity within planetary boundaries. And that I think can also help guide the climate transition. Thank you very much and um, back to you Anders.